Okay, welcome everyone to the Safe Systems Seminar featuring Eric Howard, and, and I'm sure that many of you already know Eric Howard, um, and he's going to talk about from you know, his, his perspective and his vast experience uh, what the safe system means um, and, in a global perspective. Now, the other thing, um, I want to do a little promo of this book. I don't know if, it, if people have, have come across this book yet. It's hot off the, the press, really. Um, produced by the OECD um, International Transport Forum, uh, where Eric was the chair um, of the group that, that uh, developed this, this document, which was released... Released in 2008, recommends significant changes in the level of long-term ambition adopted by all countries, the importance of strengthening road safety management capacity, the need for a new safe system approach to road safety risk, and the importance of quantified interim targets derived from agreed specific strategies and actions and steps necessary to meet the funding uh, management and political challenges facing governments and communities internationally in improving road safety performance. He's been responsible also for in the introduction of the safe system approach to road safety in Australia and its use under, and as underpinning rationale to address road safety uh, risk and its incorporation in the national road safety action plans from 2004. So Eric here is the father of the safe system, so who better than to invite along to tell us all about the safe system approach. Thanks, Laurie. Hand it to you, Eric. Thanks, Laurie. Boy, that's a long introduction. Um, it's great to be here. What I want to do tonight, and I thank Laurie and Raf for, for inviting me to come up and, uh, and do this today, and thank you for coming along. I really hope you get something worthwhile out of it, uh, because that's what it's all about. I want to try and encourage you today to think, some of you, to think slightly differently about road safety and about how safe system gives us, I think, a very interesting framework for moving forward. When we all leave this room, hopefully we'll have a genuine and closer agreement around the way forward with road safety, but it won't be any different for all those people out there that you interact with, all of the politicians that you serve, all of the community people that you deal with. It's tough caper, this. Road safety in terms of public policy is one of the toughest games in town, and I, I can say that from experience. But I want to take you through some of the things Laurie referred to this document. It was quite an experience putting this together. I had a lot of help. I didn't write it. I basically had my input, of course. But there were a lot of people from all over the place, a lot of Australian input into this, from South Australia, Western Australia, Monash Uni, uh, Vic Roads, uh, people throughout, throughout Australia, solid practitioners, put their thoughts forward in this document. There were 32 countries involved, the World Bank, the World Health Organisation, FIA Foundation. We think it's a pretty good summation of good practice in road safety. So I'll try and give you a quick insight into that today, then go on to talk about vision, talk about ambition, talk about safe system, and then some, some concluding thoughts, and then I'd be happy to take questions. I'll try and keep my remarks to about 40 minutes. So, thanks, Hussain. We'll push on. This is just a quote from fellow Cornelison. I don't know him, I've never met him, but I think it's a very good quote. We can make the traffic system that's in Europe as safe as they want to. The road crash problem is man-made and it can be remedied. And the problem is we've all grown up with it. We all think that people will die on the roads because people die on the roads. It's just a very dangerous environment. Well, it certainly is, and we know that as a group, but it doesn't need to be. It's there because we've allowed it to develop the way that it is and we accept risks in our road travel that we don't accept in other parts of our life. And convincing, understanding that and getting our community and political masters to understand that and react to it is a constant challenge. And I mean, you people in New South Wales have done a fantastic job in the last couple of years with your road toll. Was it 5.6 per 100,000 last year? Fantastic achievement, and I salute you for that because I know what's behind that. It's really, really tough, and that's a great effort. So you're in, a, you're in a great place to say we know what it's like to achieve success and we're ready to do more. Thanks for saying. I've talked about this report and I want to quickly run through some of the findings from it. Thank you. First of all, there are some things we found there in the white that I won't run through, but they related more to targets, and that's not really the purpose of the discussion today. But 
And the yellow there, the lack of a longer term vision. Most places don't have a long term vision. The Swedes certainly do. Uh, the Dutch do. The Norwegians do. The Finns sort of do. Most other places don't have a long term vision. Western Australia does since last week. There's a lot of unease around the world among practitioners at the levels of trauma and a feeling that much more can be done. But people are reluctant to implement known solutions, not because they don't know how to, because they don't know what to do, they don't know how to convince the political level to do it most often. And you're no strangers to that, as, as indeed in Victoria we're not any strangers to it either. And there was a lack of certainty and confidence about knowing how to do it. Thanks for saying. Okay, the second, uh, further findings, uh, yeah, a lot of focus on bits and pieces, individual interventions, but not what's necessary to make what's going on out there fundamentally safer. <coughs> what's out there is unsafe. How do we make it safe? Well, certainly, how do we make it safer? So the safe system approach is not yet widely understood or implemented. Institutional management arrangements. The underpinning, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, the underpinning of the arrangements that support our interventions and help us get results, how we organise ourselves, they're not adequate. And again, in New South Wales, based on uh, what uh, Michael DeRuze was saying last Friday in Melbourne at a, at a workshop we were together at, I think what you've done to the Centre for Road Safety is very, very interesting in that sense. I think it's a very, very strong development, based on what I know, I think for all its challenges, it's a very, very interesting model. The Swedes, of course, have a traffic safety inspectorate that sits right out separate from the road authority and comments on the behaviours and the activities of the road authority and, and others. That's an interesting model. That's, that's as far removed from the integrated model in Australia as I know exists. What you've done is attempt to move a little bit towards that, and I think it's very, very interesting, and I, I commend you for it. It'd be interesting to see how that that travels in the next few years. And the public doesn't know anything about safe system. You know, little, little has been done to inform them that they don't have to put up with what's going on out there. It isn't a fait, it's a fait accompli, but it's not a necessary thing. It can be changed. Thanks, Hussain. So we looked at raising, what do you need to do to raise the level of ambition in a community? To take the community to the point where they realise that death and serious injury can be substantially reduced. And in Australia we've done that reasonably effectively, but you'd still find a lot of people out there, if you were to suggest a death and serious injury can be removed from the road environment, they'd laugh at you. They'd say, that's just not possible. Uh, and the report basically says that we can lift that level of long-term ambition substantially. Lift it, lift it substantially, and as the title of the report suggests, towards zero, which is in fact the title that WA has adopted for their strategy. We can get there. We can eradicate death and serious injury. We can't do it tomorrow, though, so we need interim goals, and they're usually the five to ten year strategies that we embark upon. So the picture that the report is trying to paint is a series of intermediate steps that get reductions over each five or ten years, but ultimately we remove the scourge from our, uh, from our societies. Thanks, Hussain. So should we just look at progressing to that next step downwards, so beloved of politicians, because it's safe and familiar and, yes, we can probably do it? Why aren't we saying we can eliminate this problem in the long term? We can ulti ultimately eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. Thanks, Hussain. And we argue that all countries can adopt the elimination vision. You don't have to say when you're going to get there because it will take differing amounts of time and it's going to be difficult in some cases to get there without fundamental change. But it's telling the community, what, what's powerful about it, it's saying to the community, this is a reasonable long-term expectation. This is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. This is a reasonable thing to look at doing. And there is a strong and growing market for safety in our community. I'd suggest the market for safety in our homes is much stronger than it is in Pitt Street. Mm. Much stronger. Because politicians tend to be a little removed from the reality of life, a little more cosseted, a little more reactionary. And it's Volvo, I'll put that note in there. Volvo came out last year and said by 2020, no one in a Volvo who buys a Volvo after 2020 will be killed or seriously injured 
in a motor vehicle crash, and no pedestrian will be killed or seriously injured by a Volvo. Now, leaving aside how they're going to do that, and I have great confidence in Volvo, having seen some of their um, technology, that is, an, that is an, a profound statement. You know, here's a private sector organisation nailing its colours to the mast and saying we're going to do this. And I think there's a very real risk that the public sector, governments, could be left behind in this. And then all the fingers will no longer be pointing at the car manufacturers, they'll be pointing at drivers, as they always have. It's your fault, we're going to blame someone. And they'll be pointing at road authorities, you're, you're not doing the right thing. We mustn't get left behind. And that's a message for politicians as well. Thanks, Hassan. So the level of ambition, well, you know, what, what, do you, what do you hitch your star to as an interim target? I guess the best guide I'd suggest is what good practice countries are doing. Good practice jurisdictions like New South Wales. So you don't, need, you don't need to think too much about that. The sort of jumps you're looking to make in the next five to ten years are uh, good practice. But you need to, to develop performance indicators to measure how well you're going, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Thank you. So th there's the ambitious vision. Elimination with steady progress in the interim. That's what we want. It is achievable and we need to talk that up. And we now have a case study in Australia where a government has actually gone into Parliament and said essentially that. And we shouldn't underestimate how powerful that is. You're going to have people in this community saying, why aren't New South Wales doing this? In Victoria they'll be saying, why are you doing this? That's, that's how the Australian system tends to work, and that's great. Thanks, Asan. The importance of a clear vision. Well, I, I, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here, but Sweden we know vision zero how stakeholders are encouraged to take action to play their part, how the road environment's managed, and of course that fundamental recognition that travel speed is absolutely crucial to uh, safe outcomes. Kinetic energy is so important, it determines whether we live or die. Thanks, the same. And the Swedes, of course, have done so many things, and those of you who've been there or read about it know this, and... Um, Tremendous vehicle crash protection improvements, working closely with Saab and Volvo. The crash protective barriers on rural roads, the source of so much that we've done in New South Wales and Victoria and other states, so much of the learning. Uh, rural road speed limits based on the level of road protection, I'll come back to that. We don't really get that yet here in Australia. Roundabout treatments, 30k zones, better compliance, they could learn a lot from New South Wales we run the best behavioural programs in the world by a long, long way, Australian road safety authorities. But the Swedes do their best. 200,000 speeding tickets are issued a year in Sweden. You'd probably do that in about, well, six weeks, eight weeks here, I don't know. Uh, they promote safety as a competitive variable in road transport contracts. So if you want the contract, you've got to be prepared to say, we will adhere to speed limits, drink driving and so on. If you're the bus company owned by, say, the city of Gothenburg and you want to keep the contract, you have to make sure that your drivers don't exceed speed limits or drink and drive and so on. And if they do, there'll be contract penalties. That's taking safety from being a nice idea to being a fundamental reality and making it part of daily life. The Swedes have done some really good things in that regard. And then the employer's work, workplace uh, safety responsibilities. We were talking about this earlier over at the centre. Um, when you're travelling for work-related purposes, you are in a mobile office, and OH&S has so much to teach us about this. Thanks, Hassan. The Netherlands, their clear vision is called sustainable safety, as you know, and a little different to the Swedes, not quite as, not quite as strong a moral quality. It's recognising there may be some limits economically and so on. But, I mean... I think the trend is very clear. Human, human life continues to get more and more valued in real terms as we go through history. And um, I see the economic justifications matching the moral justifications in the years ahead because it's soon, if we can get willingness to pay in place, we will soon have almost a doubling of benefit cost ratios for road safety interventions in Australia. Don't ask me why we haven't got willingness to pay, but uh, it needs to happen. Um, and they're the, so they're the sorts of things the Netherlands has in place um, and the traffic system has to be forgiving so that road users, buy, if, if they make a mistake, they're not killed. Thanks the same. And then, of course, we've got our own model now in WA. 
their minister, thanks for saying, it's a statement of the parliament, um, asked members to take moral high ground, refuse to accept that death and serious injury are an inevitable result of using our road system. They are certainly not acceptable consequences. Our bold new road safety strategy, its core theme is we, we should never accept road trauma as a fact of life. It will challenge us to strive for zero deaths and serious injuries on our roads. WA have got to deliver yet. It's a big challenge. But they've had the courage to put that out there and to say we're going to, we're going to go for it. And I think it's terrific. Thanks, the same. If we're looking at the safe system approach, I mentioned the importance of the institutional management functions. This is just a little diagram that's in the report, but it's drawn from World Bank work, a document that's about to be published on road safety management. And we all tend to focus on the results at the top of the pyramid and the interventions. We all understand those things. But as I said before, it's the institutional management functions that really determine whether you've got the capacity to make those things happen. Have you got a strong results focus? Well, you have. WA has. Have you got strong coordination? Could probably be better within government, across agencies. Is the legislation adequate? Pretty good. Pretty good behavioural programs. Funding and resource allocation. I'm sure some more money would help. Promotion. And promotion in its broadest sense. Promotion in terms of advocacy, successful advocacy to the political level. And, you know, you've got, you've got a tough school in this state, <laughs> politically, compared to most other jurisdictions in Australia. That's a reality and it's got to be faced up to and dealt with. It's a very sensitive, the great sensitivity at political level to doing difficult things. It exists in other states as well, but I think this has always been seen as a pretty tough school. Monitoring and evaluation, we always have to check, are we getting value for money, are we doing the right thing? And then of course R&D and knowledge transfer, and you're here today, you're part of all that. Thanks for saying. So there, there, there they are, they're those seven institutional management functions. And going into various countries as I've had opportunity to do in recent years, these are the things that are missing. These are the fundamental flaws that they, they often don't have. And, you know, you've only got to find the right key to unlock the view of a politician in a key role to have enormous uh, impacts. The right statement at the right time. And if the coordination at ministerial level involves three or four key ministers meeting two or three times a year with their chief executives and agreeing on a joint plan to go into cabinet, that's extremely powerful as well. It's pretty rare. It's been one of Victoria's great strengths in the last 10 years, but it's an example of the sort of coordination at that very high level that can help and deliver extra benefit. Thanks for saying. And there's some of the things within the results focus heading. I don't want to go into detail, but have you got a good political institutional framework? Is there a clear lead agency, would you have here? Are the roles and responsibilities clearly defined and are they clearly accepted? You would know that better than I. Uh, and developing management capacity. What are the issues? Developing safe system thinking, evidence-based approaches. And a really good interim strategy with associated interim target. Thanks for saying. But these things are crucial for road safety results focus. And good road safety management capacity does those things. You've got to underpin improved capacity for development of the delivery of those interventions. You don't have the capacity to go and argue for them. You're not going to get them in place. And you don't have the structures to help you argue for them. Uh, you've got to accept a changed set of objectives. And that's never easy. And you guys are all in the change management business. Whether we realise it or not, this is, this is really leading edge change management road safety and you are all in it. Oh, that sounds like me. I thought I'd turn it off. I'm sorry. We've got to support genuine partnerships with other agencies and that's very hard. When you've got to go outside your, outside your comfortable sphere of activity and go and extend support never easy to go out and, and reach out to other groups and say, we want to come and sit down with you and help and together find a way to work through this, particularly if the group you feel, that group has actually done you in the eye in the last few months or not been carrying their weight. And one, of the, one of the challenges in road safety is to get over that and put up with perhaps feeling that you've you know, got, got an unfair deal in this partnership, but focus on the future and... Uh, Again, I speak from experience. If you're prepared to put that behind you and look at what you can do together, it's remarkable what can be achieved. 
And I think there are some partnership issues in, in all states, in all jurisdictions, where things can be stronger. Reviewing and revising standards. I'm going to talk about safe system in detail in a moment. But until we've got the young engineer, male or female, sitting out in one of the regions of New South Wales, putting some proposals together to scope a project thinking safe system, it won't happen. And we can have agreement at this level, this is a good start, but we've got to get it through to the people who actually make those day-to-day -day decisions. And that's probably a five to ten year challenge. Staff development. Encourage innovation. Safe system is about innovation. Finding the very thoughtful ways that make the system safer and respond to your particular crash problem in your jurisdiction. Sweden has lots of head-on crashes on their two-lane, two-way highways. They've got a very distributed population, lots of medium-sized towns, and their volumes, lo lots of country roads, two-lane, two-way highways with volumes between five to 10,000 vehicles a day. We don't have that much in Australia. There's very few uh, roads in this country now that aren't duplicated that have 5,000 vehicles a day outside the cities, the high speed roads. So our crash problem tends not to be head-ons, but tends to be run off road. Uh, that's, that's the crash type that we have. And so it's, it's very important that the solutions you come up with reflect the problems that you have and are innovative in their own right and managing outcome performance. It's one thing to have ideas and to have interventions and to get outputs, but you've got to measure those outcomes and make sure you're hitting the mark. Thanks, the same. So what's a safe system approach? And this rather complex little graphic, I'll talk in a bit more detail about that in a moment. Thank you. It's a framework to assess, guide and improve the safety of travel. We want a road system that allows for human error without leading to death or serious injury, a safe network. The crash forces on the human body, we want them to be limited to what's survivable. And we know from, uh, we know from experience what are those, uh, what's needed to get those forces down to a level of survivability. And the responsibility for reducing risk is not just on the shoulders of the road user, it's shared by the system providers, the road authorities, the vehicle manufacturers, the people who let contracts for transport, the consigners, the uh, freight forwarders and so on. All of the people who play a part in the transport network and that's just about everyone. Thank you. And essentially the safe system says that if road users are alert and compliant we can't yet say that if you're drunk or if you're exceeding speed limits or you're full of drugs that we can look after you and pre prevent you being killed or seriously injured. But it's saying if you're not, if you're not those things and you, you're not fatigued, you've had a good night's rest, then if you're doing those things, the combination of your speed of travel, the vehicle safety features in the vehicle that you're in, and the road and roadside features in the environment that you're in, the road environment that you're in, should be such that it, in any crash, the forces that the human beings in that vehicle are subjected to will not exceed fatality thresholds. You won't be killed. We also hope you won't be seriously injured. That's a bit tougher again. But the starting point is you won't be killed. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So the combination of these three factors results in you surviving. And that has real implications for infrastructure design, certainly for vehicle design, and certainly for speed limits and speed compliance. But we're talking about compliant users here. There are four critical support acts in those boxes around the side. Firstly, you've got to understand your crashes. If you don't know what your problem is, you're unlikely to be able to come up with a solution. Secondly, you've got to have good road rules, good enforcement, good legislation, good enforcement, a good court system, a good culture of what, a good acceptance of, of what the social norms are that, are, that, are, that implement road safety. The top one is admittance to the system. That's about licensing and young drivers and you know, how we handle older drivers and so on and how we deal with people who are excluded from the system. This one is probably the most challenging of the lot. And it says education and information supporting road users. What it's really saying is, have we got across to the public what we're on about and do they support us? And that's the big challenge, I think, for all of us. 
not only to do this, but to explain to the public why we're doing it. And it's very hard to do contentious things if the community doesn't understand why you're doing it. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it leads to short careers. So you've really got to get ahead of the game and get this message across to the public. Thanks, Hussain. If we just take, and I apologise to Pierre Ramborg, it's his graph, but I've, I've modified it a bit just to make it a little easier to follow. Just taken three of the major crash types. I haven't taken the runoff road because if you run off the road and hit trees which are near the side of the road in Australia in proportions you won't see in most other countries, developed countries in the world, then if you hit on your side of the car at more than about 30 kilometres an hour, pretty good chance you'll be killed. And Raf knows this stuff better than I do, but it's, it's just a point load slicing into the side of a car is hitting at its most vulnerable spot with an incredibly concentrated load. And it doesn't do much good to people inside the vehicle. So speed can't really do much for you there. But what I'm trying to show here is your fatality risk goes up dramatically at certain speed thresholds. And if you're a pedestrian and you're hit by a vehicle travelling at 30 kilometres an hour, there's a very low probability of being killed. But look how quickly it escalates as the speed increases. For side impact crashes, similarly at 50 kilometres an hour, there's a very good chance you'd survive. Head protecting curtain airbags, other things within vehicles are helping this, this figure. But you know, we've still got a long way to go to get that into all our vehicles. Head on crashes, if we're hit at about 70, and I gather that's sneaking up a little bit these days, but about 70 kilometres an hour, there's a pretty good chance you'll survive the crash. Now that, that little graphic, if there's one thing you carried around in your back pocket in the next year or two to explain safe system, that would be it. Because it's, it says very clearly that given the circumstances with infrastructure and with vehicles, speed is so critical to the chances of surviving a crash. So why do we have intersections that have speed limits greater than 50? Why do we have pedestrian areas where the speed limits are greater than 30? Why do we have two-lane, two-way roads where the speed limits are greater than 70? Because we don't understand the risk. It's always been that way. And Australia, I have to say, compared to all other developed nations, including the United States, has the most inappropriate speed limits for the poorest quality infrastructure. There are reasons for our infrastructure quality. We've got more, road, more kilometres of road per taxpayer than any, any other developed country. But we've just grown up with the speed limits and we've not wanted to confront the risk relationship with the standard of the infrastructure. Thanks, the same. And they're just those, those figures again. Thank you. So the safe system, it recognises the limits of force the human body can survive. Uh, it focuses on systematically addressing the factors in specific crash types to reduce the risk of injury, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll run an example of intersections. Crashes are always going to happen, even though we're trying to prevent them but we're going to try and minimise the severity of injury when that crash occurs. And road users shouldn't die because of system failings. And it does require innovation and a very long-term commitment to improving outcomes. And you'd all be aware of crash types where, you know, as for example, mum has got the little baby in the back seat, I think of one woman on the Geelong Road at home about 10 years ago. She apparently was distracted by the baby, looked up, she was in the unsealed shoulder, overcorrected, went straight across the dual carriageway through the median and was cleaned up by a truck coming down the other carriageway. There was no, no sealed shoulders, there were no tactile edge lines, there were no median barriers and this was on the Geelong Road which has thankfully since been upgraded. It's very simple, the system, is not, the system in that location was not safe, it is now but it hasn't saved her life. But, but you could look at examples like this right across Australia. Thanks the same. So we want, we want five star people got their seatbelt on, they're at the right speed, they're not full of booze or drugs and they're not fatigued. We want five star cars, five star roads where we can and five star speed limits and if we can't get five star roads we certainly want five star speed limits for that road. Thank you. A couple of quotes from the OECD uh, report. The safe system manager is prepared to step into environments where analyses and targets may be challenged by and challenge other aspects of social and economic life. We're in the change management business, folks, you know that. 
And we've got to be prepared to do this. Because no one else knows. No one else out there understands this stuff. And system designers should accept responsibility for the safety of users of the road transport system and explain the constraints within, you, within which users need to operate. Again, people don't realise when they whip down a highway with trees by the side of the road and they're travelling at 110 kilometres an hour. It's an incredible risk that they're taking. It's just not understood. It doesn't get any coverage. Thanks, Hussain. Just the setting of speed limits. And it's been, you know, a, a great judgement by society over the years. And Jack McLean from... Uh, well, he was at uh, the Centre for Accident Research, Automobile, Automobile Research, Automotive Research? I think so. Yeah, in Adelaide. Um, he calculated how many lives had been lost in Australia because when speed limits were metricated in the 70s, we went up to 60 instead of going down to 50. I think it's about 2,700 people have lost their lives as a result of that decision. <coughs> now... You know, some people might argue with the accuracy of the 2700. The point is it's a lot of people. And it's directly attributable to that decision, its impact on travel speeds. And we used to, ha we used to base our speed limit setting on the 85th percentile. This is in Sweden. On the 85th percentile. That was, they used to do that in Sweden in the 60s. We were still doing it in Australia in the 90s. Then they moved to accident-related criteria where the crashes were greater, the speed limits would be reduced. Then they looked at sort of social economic criteria. What's the cost of reducing speeds compared to... Um, uh, what's the cost of yeah, reducing the speeds compared to the benefit? And, of course, the Swedes have moved to these injury-related criteria, which is what I've just shown you. The speed limits being set on the basis of reducing loss of life and serious injury. Thanks, the same. So... Safe system and speed, we, we need to adopt a safe system approach to our networks, that's what I'm saying, but we need strategies to better manage crash forces and that's got to include speed limits which reflect the level of protection that's not going to kill people. Formula One, which I, for no, in no way do I want to promote it, but you'd have to say that they have a...